Hello, everyone. Well, welcome to this Our Whole Lives webinar on Our Whole Lives and Racial Justice. We are thrilled that you're here today, whether you are watching us live or have caught us afterwards. I'm Amy Johnson. I'm the United Church of Christ Minister for Sexuality, Education, and Justice, and I'm here with a host of other folks today to lead us through this conversation. Um, before I go through introductions, I do want to just announce that next month's webinar will be on November 11th, so it will be on the second Wednesday instead of the first Wednesday. I'll remind you that uh, again at the end. And also, um, we are going to be using the Q&A feature down at the bottom of your screen uh, to you for any questions that you have, and we will leave time at the end for that. So please use the Q&A feature rather than a chat for any questions that you have. I'd like to introduce Melanie Davis, who's with me here today. Melanie? Hi, everybody. I am the Unitarian Universalist Association's OWL Program Manager. And uh, I'm really excited about today's program and grateful for our panelists. Thank you. Thanks. And with us today for this, um, this panel discussion is our moderator, Anil Uman. Anil? Hi, my name is Anil Uman, and I am the interim director at Pacific University's Eugene campus here in Eugene, Oregon. And I, I teach courses around um, critical race theory and um, identity. Thanks, Anil. I should also mention that uh, Anil and all of our panelists are our whole lives trainers and um, come to this discussion with uh, multiple lenses of experience and, um, and uh, wisdom. Uh, Cedric. Good afternoon, I'm uh, Reverend Cedric Harmon. Uh, Associate Reverend Cedric Harmon, Executive Director of Many Voices, the Black Church Movement for Gay and Transgender Justice, and I'm based in Durham, North Carolina. Great. Thanks, Cedric. Aisha? Hi, I'm Aisha Hauser. I am the part of the lead ministry team of the Church of the Larger Fellowship, and I'm also president of the Liberal Religious Educators Association and an OWL trainer. Nice to be here. Thank you. And Kim, you're muted. Sorry. Hello, everyone. My apologies. I'm Reverend Kim Kendrick. I serve as the chaplain and pastor of Bethany Children's Home in Walmersdorf, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. I'm a native of Philadelphia and a proud OWL trainer. It's good to be with you today. Thanks, Kim. So we are coast to coast today with you all, and we want to um, start by giving a little frame for this discussion today. Um, this is an important topic. This is a crucial topic. It has been for a very long time, and especially now um, in the current climate, we are very, very happy to have this opportunity to talk with these folks today. We recognize that many people are in many different places around their own work and journey around anti-racism and anti-oppression. We have put together this panel so that we can particularly have voices that are familiar, familiar with those uh, anti-racist and anti-oppression work and lens and experience and also the Our Whole Lives work. So we really um, implore you not to go rogue on us, honestly. And if you have questions to please put them in the Q&A and if you have questions about the intersections of anti-racism and OWL, that you reach out to me or Melanie after this, uh, after this webinar so that we can inform you and keep you informed of what other things that we are doing to address these issues, which we are doing and we're taking uh, very seriously and doing some deep uh, work around this. But we really want to make sure as much as possible that no one is unintentionally causing harm uh, that is, do no harm is really an important part of what we are about today and always. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to our amazing uh, panel and have them lead us in this amazing discussion today. Anil. Great. Thank you, Amy and, and Melanie. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to share a few, few slides with you to walk us through the beginning here. And then when it's time for us to um, have the panel discussion, I'll take the slides down. 
Mm. So, oops. There we go. Sorry about that. So, a quick overview. Um, we've had our introductions. I'll I'll give some definitions, and then we'll talk a little bit about, or I'll share a little bit about the characteristics of white supremacy culture, and then we'll talk. We'll take a look at the our whole lives values, and then the the big part of our, our time here in the webinar is the panel discussion, and then I'll um, take some questions for, for the panelists. So here are the definitions, excuse me, here are the definitions. Um, anti-racist, one who is supporting an anti-racist policy through their actions or expressing an anti-racist idea. This is from Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And Excuse me. White supremacy is the manufacture and maintenance of systems of, and structures for whites only. This is uh, from Reggie Williams from an article in the Christian Century. Um, another thing that Ibrahim, Ibrahim Kendi says is that definitions anchor us in principles. And one of the things that we were hoping to connect and um, interconnect in this is, is our, whole our whole lives values and um, anti-racism. So giving us a, a starting point, not an ending point, but a starting point for the discussion um, to enter into this discussion around anti-racism anchored in our own principles and values. So let's just take a minute to look at the characteristics of white supremacy. I'm just gonna read them and just um, take it in Think about how they show up in, in your life um, and no need to um, overthink it, but just for, for right now, just taking it, taking it in. Perfectionism, sense of urgency, defensiveness, quantity over quality, worship of the written word, paternalism, either or thinking, power hoarding, fear of open conflict, individualism, progress is bigger, more, objectivity, right to comfort, now take a look at our whole, the Our Whole Lives values. In the K through one and four through six, the ones that are lifted up are respect, relationship, and responsibility. These are considered the, the three R's um, of the um, childhood sexuality education. For the seven through nine and 10 through 12 curricula, it's on the right, self-worth, sexual health, responsibility and justice and inclusivity. So I'm gonna go through a series of questions now. Um, so thank you for taking a minute to set our compass and frame the discussion for our panelists. So we'll get started with our questions and I will take the slides off. All right, um, let's start with our first question and that is, how do you see our whole lives values as a possible starting point for addressing the prevalence and persistence of white supremacy? Do you want any one of us to start? <laughs> yes, any one of you can start. Sorry, I didn't. I, I think when I was, so I, I'll start, Aisha. Um, one, I think already the premise of uh, respect, relationship, responsibility, and, and explicitly naming justice and inclusive, inclusivity in our values as a start. And the part that I think also needs to be lifted up is self-worth and how society, the messages in the media, which Owl talks about, um, or we communicate about messages about our bodies and who we are, are different depending on our identity, social location, ability, and so I, and, and that, while that is named um, in OWL, I think there is room for naming it even further to be, so 
clarity is our friend and as explicit as we can be will help dismantle um, white supremacy that some of the characteristics so fear of the reason why we tend to kind of take the circuitous route sometimes to points we need to make is fear of open conflict but if we say the uncomfortable thing i mean we're already talking about sexuality which you know half the world thinks is uncomfortable if you say anything but you know we have different names for different body parts so we're already there we just get there in terms of um, race as well i'll leave it there thank you aisha I, I want to piggyback off of that. Thank you, Aisha. Um, and, and, and things that were said already, I, I think specifically on the value of responsibility in the current climate, specifically what ha is just now happening with, um, with leadership in or under this uh, current administration and leadership trying to get a stimulus package, right? And then a leader coming along and saying, no, we're not going to do that or we're going to stop talks on that, right? Um, and then saying, well, maybe. And so, and really toying with people's pockets and toying with people's lives and potentially endangering um, has me thinking about the value of responsibility and that toying with people's economic and social justice and, and education and housing um, and just the livelihood um, is irresponsible. And so with that, responsibility, um, we have a responsibility to be a healthy self, um, a healthy individual, um, our communities, as well as our immediate self. Um, and so when Anil brought up the characteristics of white supremacy, that individuality, individuality is irresponsible, is irresponsible. And so um, that's how I see uh, the value of, of our whole lives, the values that are embedded within our whole lives intersection intersecting with um, anti racism. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So as I this is Cedric. So as I was thinking, well, thank you, Aisha and Kim, I was thinking about the reality that a vast majority of us have been mis misinformed uh, around sexuality. Uh, our starting point is from a place of misunderstanding uh, and confusion. But the same is true around race. Our starting point is a place of misinformation and confusion, and also therefore fear of even engaging in conversations around sexuality and conversations around race. The values become a portal. As a matter of fact, it becomes the bedrock of the music because the values are the music. So if you think of the, the bedrock being those values and that being the scales and also the treble clef or the cleft that the music is played on, then these values give us a way in to these very complicated conversations around sexuality and around race, because the starting point becomes those values, and that sets the rhythm and the tone by which we will engage in these complicated conversations. Thank you. Amen, someone says. <laughs> Amen, definitely. <laughs> All right, so um, question two, what do the intersections of, of anti-racism work and our whole lives values look like? You, you may select an OWL value and share how you think it aligns with active anti-racist work or just speak from, your, from wherever you want to. So who would like to start? So I had an experience, I was thinking about this question, um, although I might be mixing it up with another question, but I'm gonna go right ahead. Um, uh, uh, I was in a train, I led a training, co-led a training um, at some point, I don't even know when, because the time doesn't mean anything anymore, um, where we were talking about mandated reporting. It was elementary age. And it was at the height, uh, well, ICE was just rounding up people, immigration and customs, people. Um, and so one of the points I made was be very diligent. Don't make a call to any social services on your own. Like you have to be super careful, right? The pushback I got was from a white woman nurse who said, I'm a mandated reporter. I have to make that call. I could get fired. And I said, here's the thing that's happening to Kim's point. Nothing happens in a vacuum. We are in a political climate right now where we're going to have to make decisions between 
our individual selves or caring for community and keeping people from being killed or deported or both. So what I said to this woman is, you don't know if you're making things worse. What if you make a call and there are undocumented people in the home? What if you are making a call and you, you I'm not saying don't or do, I'm saying please do it responsibly. And so it was a tense moment and we processed it after, I'm not gonna keep going with that, but, but I also co-led a training in Alaska where the mandate the reporting discussion was, yeah, we, it takes a lot for us to make that call because we know how much damage it's gonna do, especially if it's um, a Native American tribe. So it went, like they were there with, okay, we know we, we have to, you know, what does care look like for this person? What is the issue? So even mandated reporting, for, for frankly, white people is, we're gonna care, the system's gonna swoop in and care for you is the, is the, I mean, that's not even necessarily true, but that's the, you know, we do, what does care look like? What does transformative justice look like? What is care for community? And so that was a really chart in the whole, you know, we had a room of 20 people watching this exchange because I said, we, we can't anymore pretend we're not living in the political climate we're in. And there's going to be a time where I'm going to have to make a decision that, yep, I might get fired, but I'd rather try to save that person's life or, or not make this person's, this family's life worse. Um, and, and these are real life things to think about. Um, just don't do things individually. Like individualism is the part of the root of the horror that we're living right now. Everybody's on their own. Well, we're not on our own. And, and we're, you know, we're right now headed toward myelation because people think this is how we're living is okay. Some do, not us, obviously. Okay, I'll go with Cedric again. Um, so it was really difficult for me to think of just or just go with one value <laughs> in response to this question. So I chose two, uh, although all of them actually apply. Responsibility, as Kim was talking about uh, earlier in our time together, we are called to enrich our lives by expressing sexuality in ways that enhance human wholeness and fulfillment and express love commitment, delight, and pleasure. So when looking at anti-racism work, this idea of enriching our lives and our ability to express our full selves is core and is very much tied into doing anti-racism work. And then of course, justice and inclusivity naturally fit in with the work of anti-racism. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you think about what we're actually doing in confronting racism is we are calling out and claiming justice equally applied to all flesh, to all flesh, which leads me to a brief story. So I was reading earlier in the week and I was looking at a story of a young ballerina who, who spoke about their experience in learning ballet. And there was a particular experience where the instructor said to the class, please go out and buy flesh toned tights. And so this young woman, being a person of color, being a black girl, bought tights that matched her skin tone, brought them back to class. And the instructor said, no, I said, flesh tone because the instructor's understanding of flesh tone was through the lens of whiteness. And the student understood that my flesh is this tone. Why would I buy tights that do not match my flesh? And this student valued their own flesh. These are the ways in which we are not being justice seekers and justice makers. And the ways in which we come with a lens that is unexamined and we do harm, even when we think we're just being correct. Can I just, go ahead, Kim. No, I was, I was, I was giving snaps to to yourself and and Cedric. Also, um, I recall that article. 
Um, and, and I wrote down the lens, the lens um, unexamined. Yes. And so, yes, I'm just giving snaps also. Well, I just thought of, I, I had a conversation. Uh, so the Unitarian Universalism um, has a ministry, Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism. And we had a convening um, a few years ago where a Black mom of a teenage son said to me, I will never put my Black son in our whole lives with white children uh, because his body is sexualized and that is not addressed. And so how, I would love for there to be an owl separately for Black children and Black youth, and then for people of color of different, I mean, because that, that I think will be the beginning of, of, of having um, a justice anti-racist lens with owl, because Black bodies are sexualized in our, since 1619, right, in a way that others simply aren't, and that needs to be, and it isn't addressed. And so I, when, when, when this mother said that to me, I was just, it was kind of a punch in the gut, like, yeah, this is a huge gap in what we present, because when there's a room, and you see, United Church of Christ is also, without, I mean, I know you all have black churches, which you use don't, except for blue, brick and mortar, um, UCC. So I don't know if you all have, I actually, that's a question. Do you all, have you offered um, our classes only for black, Children and youth, or, or POC. Um, if you're asking about the United Church of Christ, UCC. Uh, yeah, I know you yeah. don't. <laughs> um, I, there, there are some churches that are predominantly people of color, um, and we have had a training with all African American um, participants. Um, I'm wondering, Kim, if you want to address that question. I was going to jump in, yes, um, and that I would say not a, a formalized invitation, but just by the way in which um, uh, specifically the congregation that I was senior pastor in Philadelphia um, and the, the geographic, the demographics, I would say, of our congregation in a neighborhood, we were almost always 100% uh, um, children of color, youth of color, leaders of color, the facilitators of color. Um, and I agree that, there, that the code switching that often happens did not have to um, because the context was already there. Um, and even specifically in Philadelphia, when someone talked about that John, right? Uh, we didn't have to explain what that meant or when someone had a reference to something um, uh, that may have been specifically cultural, we didn't have to explain or um, be a, an act differently outside of outside of our, ourselves. And so, um, but I, I agree that that does not often show up within Al. It doesn't often show up. And so it, it would be something of a um, welcome, a welcome to have uh, Al specifically um, offered to people of color, specifically um, Black folks. Um, yeah. Thank you all. Um, I had a little bit of technical difficulty and I'm back. I think um, we'll move to the next question. Um, can you all see me okay, uh, panelists? Okay, thank you. Great, we'll go to the next question. I apologize for the technical <laughs> um, piece here. Um, what are your recommendations on how OWL facilitators or trainers can operationalize an anti-racist lens when implementing the OWL curriculum? Okay, I'm happy to go first on this one. I've been waiting for this question. I love this Thank question. Thank you, Cedric. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, when I read the question, the first thing I thought of is I thought of the experience that I had co-training co with Lynn Young. Now, Lynn Young and I are not twins by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I'm a cisgender, same gender loving, man of African descent, grew up in the Midwest with Southern parents, spent time in New England. And Lynn is not those things. <laughs> but we, 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 we co-trained and we co-trained with a extraordinarily inclusive and diverse set of facilitators, both ethnically, gender wise, uh, culturally, just very, very diverse in Pilgrim Furs. Uh, and so we were doing this training, and so Lynn and I had not ever met before. Uh, we spent time together at dinner. We went back to our, our housing for the night. 
And Lynn said, well, Cedric, do you have any music that you'd like to play? Because I'd like to wind down. And so I chose music that's music that I love without knowing if it would at all appeal to Lynn. And Lynn loved the music that I chose. And then Lynn said, would you play music tomorrow and for the days of the training? Could you like put together a playlist? And I chose a playlist that was a mix and blend of various styles of music from all kinds of different ways uh, of, and genres of music. And in that very, very diverse and inclusive room, you could see individuals who identified with specific music and also had curiosity about music they were not familiar with. The simple invitation to be authentically me and Lynn to be authentically Lynn and recognizing that we had a diverse crowd set the tone for the entire time together and people appreciated the diversity that had been worked into our plans around the training. It's those simple things that are not simple. They are huge in terms of creating an environment where diversity is welcomed and not shunned. Well, and also not siloed. It's not, I mean, it's, it's integrated. It's not, okay, we're gonna talk about sex. And then in the next hour, we're gonna talk about race. It's very much interwoven. So that's what's was beautiful about that. It's, it's just, you, you integrate it so that it becomes, that's part of, I think, the anti-racist work. I wholeheartedly agree with, with both of you. And again, more snaps that it's got to be an interchange. Right? It's got to be the intersections, right? The intersectionality so that people bring their whole selves, um, um, that I'm black, I'm a mother, I'm a Christian, um, I'm a same gender loving. And so how does all that fit? You know, we don't leave the house with just one shoe, right? So we've got to bring everything with us at the same time. And so the playlist has to be there. Uh, the, the shared language has to be there, the space, and, and thinking about who's at the table, who's, who's not at the table, um, and then getting more chairs um, to, to widen the table as well. Um, and, and so again, interchange. And so one of the things that I wrote down, um, I think it's already been brought up also that we can't avoid things. We can't avoid things. And so the, the conflict will arise. And so when the conflict uh, um, does present itself, how are we handling it? How are we admitting that we're uncomfortable? How are we admitting that we don't know? We don't know. And when we don't know, not always going to the people of color in the space to say, what, 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 what can I do? Where do I go? About doing our own work. Please don't have the people of cover, color doing the heavy lifting, right? Because um, Google will bless your life. And also getting together with uh, your other folks, with your cousins, get your people together to do your own work first um, so that uh, the intersectionality can happen so that all voices are heard and honored um, with the shared experience that's in the room. And I just want to lift up the irony that we teach about sex in the most explicit ways and we're so happy, we're comfortable with it. And then there are some people as soon as like something racial comes in, you suddenly become like a shrinking, you know, leaf that dried up and all of a sudden it's like, ah, so clearly we know as a, as a collective, when we're teaching OWL, how to deal with uncomfortable things, right? We learn, we're like, this is going to do this. We, and when we're training, it's an innovative component. Are you able to speak about sexuality in a way that is healthy, affirming, um, uh, holistic, so that's, that needs to be also included about race, is what does that look like? So we know how to do the thing, now we, we need to apply it with um, difficult conversations about race. It reminds me of church in terms of that we can preach the gospel and, and give people hope and, and, and be uplifting, but the minute we talk about money or sex or race or politics, it's crickets. Right, um, and we've got to call it out. We've got to call it out and name it. And I know, Anil, you're going to bring up the conversation about the circles of sexuality. Um, and so, one of the things, and should I just let you bring up that question first? You go, go for it. <laughs> one of the things I was thinking about with the circles of sexuality um, was how can we interchange those, right, um, to insert um, uh, phobias, xenophobia, um, Islamic phobia, homophobia. 
um, insert those and, and then have the conversations around that and all the isms, right? Um, so the, you know, racism and, and all the isms to insert those and start talking about it and not hide it. And so I think the circles of sexuality is a great opportunity to get in there and not hide at all, to get in there, have the conference, conversation, to be uncomfortable. Because when we're uncomfortable, I think we do our best work because we examine ourselves, we examine our community, we can examine society when we are uncomfortable. Thank you. I just want to say you all are awesome because I had some technical difficulties and I went off and you just kept going. <laughs> this is awesome. So thank you. I'm back on <laughs> and um, I want to move us on. But I want to just say a couple of things. Um, uh, Reverend Cedric, uh, thank you so much for when you mentioned the the piece about being invited in to share the music. Um, it made me think about what something I mentioned in the last webinar around the big stones and one of those is hospitality. And I think that's sort of an anchor to, to that invitation in is, is, is hospitality at its best. So these three big rocks that I talk about is boundaries, openness, and hospitality. It's something Parker Palmer talks about in terms of cre creating healthy learning spaces. And um, I really appreciate you bringing that up. And, and also, um, some of the other pieces i'm sorry I'm, i've missed and i want to be able to reiterate but but looking at the um the circles of sexuality through through a lens that uh, through multiple lenses right so that that it's we're not just looking at it as if it's completely objective but looking through these different lenses that help us to see um see more uh, melanie no, there was a question in the chat box asking mm -hmm. for uh, an example or two of how, um, Reverend Kim, what, what you were talking about, an example of how somebody might interject some of that information into a discussion of the circles of sexuality. Kim, did you, did you hear that? Kim, I'm wondering if you want to take that, or if you would like, if you would like uh, one of us to to take that about how to. Hope oh, we can't hear you. Sorry. You're on mute. Oh, you're still on mute. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a stab at it, and as you come back on, Kim, if you're able to join in, you can join your voice in. I was thinking about how we have um, the way many times that the circles are taught, or at least in, in some of the levels is to, and then in the trainings, is to have some scenarios that are placed up. So you have the circles and you've done an explanation of what the circles are, and then there are some scenarios that can go up to, um, to uh, where would you put them kind of a thing for thinking. So there's some variation of that type of activity, um, whether it's that one in particular or some other variation of discussing like, what circle does this belong in? And I believe that that's a question that we could ask at any time if anything came up. And I think that it's unlikely that nothing will come up about racism in your classes right now. And if it, it, it we have to pay attention. And so I think that it's, a completely um, fine to ask a question of, for instance, if everybody had read that article that Cedric was talking about and that Kim had, had read as well about the ballet performer, it would be entirely appropriate to say, so I wonder what you're thinking now about which circle or circles of sexuality this particular incident intersects with. So I think that that is always a question we could ask. Um, and I think that if there are, um, as we're looking at, and we are looking at, how do we um, uh, increase our adaptation and intentionally of our whole lives being anti-racist, that we, there may be more examples that are explicit in the curriculum as we move forward. Because when you're not explicit, you're centering whiteness. You're talking about this, what, what, what we've been conditioned, whoever went through grew up in this country and it doesn't take long. I'm, I'm an immigrant, but I was here as an infant um, to, to realize that the default is European. The default is white. So if you, so we, 
there needs to be intention to make sure there are examples like the article that Cedric lifted up. Like that has to be intentionally put in there and then ask, because I'm just, I just pulled up the circles of sexuality and there's nothing about race at all. So we need to add it. That needs to be added intentionally. Otherwise the default is white. Yeah, I agree. And I apologize for my technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you, um, Amy. And thank you, Asia. I, yes, I pulled up the circles as well. Um, and I, I absolutely, so I see the circles, I understand the circles of sexuality to be that model to understand um, human sexuality, right? It's, it's one of the models that we're, they're lifting up in the OWL curricula um, and that none of them act in isolation. And so I see sensuality and intimacy and sexual identity and sexual health and reproduction and sexualization. And as we do the exercises around that, centering what the, the core values are and so I agree in what Amy stated as well, if we pull out all of those and what I'm saying is to replace them. Um, uh, just briefly, when we're talking about anti-racism, replace them with the phobias, right? So as we're discussing sensuality, how can we talk about transphobia? When we're talking about intimacy, how can we talk about um, Islamophobia and sexual identity? So inserting, not replacing, but inserting any of the phobias or isms or talking about economic justice or justices, political justice, right? Talking about economic justice and housing justice and, um, and sexual justice and um, uh, our, our justice system reform, right? And talking about all those things. So utilizing it, using the model to talk about other things as an opportunity um, to combat racism and be an anti-racist. This is a really good segue into the next question. Um, it, it's in the Christian Century article, Reggie Williams writes that white supremacy is the manufacture and maintenance of systems and structures for whites only. What could a more inclusive anti-racist space for comprehensive sexuality education look like? And you, you started talking about that in, when we're talking about the circles of sexuality and inter, inter, inserting um, opportunities for us to be able to really talk about this um, more more overtly. So is there anything more that you, you want to add to that in terms of this white supremacy is the manufacture and maintenance of systems and structures for whites only? Um, how do we, how do we make a more inclusive um, our whole lives? So just before you come, um, so I was in preparation for our time together. I I was doing some reading and Juna Diaz um, has this quote. And Juna, Juna Diaz says the following, we live in a society where default whiteness goes unremarked. No one ever asks it for its passport. So when we come to the conversation around sexuality, the default, Asia, is whiteness. But the moment I walk in the room as a trainer, I bring the history of my body and the bodies of my ancestors to my facilitation and training. And I cannot come to conversations around sexuality without understanding in my very body, the ways in which bodies like mine have been hypersexualized, oversexualized, viewed as predatory. You think of it and you name it, that's the reality. And I cannot train without that awareness showing up in my training. So one way that we help to establish our whole lives as anti-racist is there are more bodies like unto my own and like unto those on this call. Because we will bring that in our very essence and embodied nature to the training. And we must be explicit. So when we're talking about sexualization uh, or when we're talking about sexual health, we cannot escape but bring up issues of inequity that are visited upon our bodies when we're having that conversation. And that's not to, to impose ourselves, but that's part of the conversation around comprehensive sexuality education. So I recall a training that we held in Raleigh, North Carolina, where we were talking about uh, reproductive health and the ways in which people access reproductive health care and the inequity that is visited upon 
people of color in accessing reproductive health care. It just came up naturally in the conversation because we had trainers that had that experience. We had people in the room from that experience and there was a richer conversation. So what I want to say is let's not refuse to approach the subject of race and racism. It's present in the room. Let's boldly approach it with awareness and training and knowledge so that we can be better trainers and facilitators to our communities. Amen, amen. Thank you, Cedric. Um, I know, I think in that article, that's Dr. Williams' article, um, that, that he, he stated that white supremacy, a script given at birth, right? A script given at birth. Um, wow, a script. White supremacy is a script given at birth and that we have to examine the history of racism, the history of white supremacy here in the United States. And so we certainly can't avoid it in, in teaching human sexuality through Al. Um, and so I just wanted to bring up briefly, uh, again, the decentering whiteness and giving a definition for that and what it means um, in addition to talk about white supremacy and white privilege um, and how in, in, in presenting the Al curriculum, um, also the heteronormativity that sometimes can permeate um, while we're, when we're doing our, our workshops and when we're presenting um, Al, that the heteronormativity um, can sometimes creep in, no matter good intentions, um, and, and thinking the norms and the language that's used, right? When we say husband and wife, or we say boys and girls, um, and how we talk about binary or non-binary, and how we talk about bodies, um, to make sure that we do something other than the script that, that Dr. Williams has talked about. Um, if I may, also own that OWL is not neutral. So, and it is a political, um, and it's getting more so with the announcement by two justices that they're not into marriage equality anymore. And so if we're going to, we are, OWL being we, is who I'm talking about, is affirming of all genders, of sexuality. And so then it can't suddenly become neutral about race. Because I, I say this as someone who's gotten feedback from people being trained, because I'm very clear that I'm, I'm not neutral. And I think I've referred to the president as a hate pumpkin. I got feedback about that. Anyway, um, that that was inappropriate. I, I, this, we're not neutral because neutrality, neutrality takes the side of the oppressor. So when we begin with the place of OWL is not a neutral curriculum, and it shouldn't be, because it is right now becoming more and more countercultural. And where at one point we thought, yay, this is progressive. It's now, in a way, like opposite of The Handmaid's Tale, right? They're ready to put a handmaiden on the Supreme Court. So let's go all the way and reject the script that we are given at birth because that's the truth because when we stay neutral we stick to the script so know that we are um unapologetically going to disrupt the system we do it with sexuality and we need to be do it much more holistically and include anti-racism thank you um again this is the next question that i have is about the racial script. So <laughs> nice segue, but you all are um, right on target here. Um, what can OWL facilitators offer in the rewriting of the so-called racial script that, or the racial script that simultaneously humanizes so-called whites and invents categories of otherness intended to justify both economic and sexual exploitation? And I just want to say, I was this question was inspired by Toni Morrison's thoughts on the origin of others, and then Reggie Williams' um, Christian Century essay on the racial script. So, what can OWL facilitators offer in the rewriting of the racial script that simultaneously humanizes so-called whites and invents categories of otherness intended to justify both economic and sexual exploitation? Love this question. These are great questions overall. They're really wonderful questions. Uh, very thoughtful. Uh, so one of the things that comes up for me around this question is without intention sometimes, blackness, communities of color, people of color are problematized and become a problem that must be fixed or become an issue 
that must be addressed, when in fact, we are human beings gifted with the good gift of sexuality as all human beings are, and the diversity of that sexuality. So when we approach anti-racism, we are, we are addressing that issue, but the people are not the issue. The issue is the issue, which is racism, white supremacy, white privilege. People operate out of those issues, but they're still human beings. And so when we say that we are given the good gift of God's great gift of human sexuality, and that all of us have been gifted with sexuality in the various ways in which we express and perform and interact with that sexuality, we are dealing with all people in their diversity and out of their diversity and with their diversity. That lens like understanding that we're dealing with human sexuality and the diversity and the gift of that sexuality in the ways in which it is expressed in all the various ways it's, it's expressed. And all of those ways are valuable and valid and to be celebrated and acknowledged. That kind of helps us debunk the problematizing of people on the basis of race and ethnicity. So I'm inviting us to think large and not make people the problem, but name the issue of racism, white supremacy, white privilege as the problem, not the people. Very nice, thank you. Um, Aisha or Kim, do you have a response for this question? I, I think Reverend Cedric uh, just went ahead and named the, name it. I mean, I, yes. Um, and so I, I think, um, yes, that, that uh, his words, his sentiments, um, his, his prophetic voice, absolutely. Um, and I, thinking also about um, Al's program assumptions, right? Um, that sexuality is a good part of the human experience and sexuality includes much more than sexual behavior and that um, people, um, need to also examine themselves and the part that they play um, in racism and carrying out. So we talk about the Karens of the world, right? And I'm so sorry for people that are named Karen, um, that now the, the name of Karen are folks calling out on barbecues and people selling items or just um, doing their daily thing, um, invading and feeling as though, going back to the characteristics of white supremacy, that individual the individualism um, just pervading and not being responsible enough. And so again, uh, Reverend Cedric, thank you. Thank you for your prophetic voice. I think one is thank you. Yes, thank you, Kim. Thank you, Cedric, Reverend Cedric. I think, thank you, Reverend Kim. Um, agreeing that we are operating on a script or, or, or agreeing, recognizing, because there's still, even among white liberals, the uh, the pervasiveness of a, of a meritocracy, which we know is bullshit. Like I'm not, I'm going to, it is not real. There is no meritocracy in this country. And, and that goes to individualism. So, so naming, like we, no one would argue the earth is flat. So we're not gonna argue that we're, not, we're all operating on a script we've been given, especially in the United States. And it's global, we've exported white supremacy. I mean, yes, the British did. We made it worse, the United States, but times 10. So naming that we are operating on a script that we need to rewrite and dismantle. We need to burn the script. And, and that, that is a shared reality that we need to have um, and not argue about. That's a fact. The fact is this, and, and then we go from there. Thank you. Um, those are the questions that I have for our panelists. And I see that there are some questions coming through the Q&A. And I think we are right on time to take some of those. Can, um, Shall I start that, or Amy, would you want to, can I just go ahead and? I would, yeah, I'd be happy Perfect. to. I wanted to um, to address a couple of things. Um, one is that somebody was asking about, um, is it a missed opportunity not to raise it when we have a captive audience? So I want to just kind of revisit this idea of what I said at the beginning. And what we're looking for is accountability that you make sure that when you are discussing, um, I think particularly, let me just name this, 
what I'm actually talking about is white people in pr prim primarily white co uh, congregations with primarily white participants. And if you are addressing racism, that you are doing that not in a vacuum. Not saying don't bring it up, not saying don't ask questions, not saying don't have the discussion, because that would be centering whiteness and that would be um, really, really not looking at an elephant in the room. But what I am saying is have some accountability. So, um, so doing your own work, Google will bless your life, as Reverend Kim has said. There are so many things that you can watch and learn about and, um, and read about whatever your preferred learning method is. So we're not saying don't bring it up. What we're saying is make sure that you're accountable and that if you find something that you think this is a glaring thing that everybody should know about, then please email me or Melanie or give us a call. Um, I, one of the other questions I would uh, throw back to the panel or, or UNL, either one of you, it says, I have parents of black and Asian children who would be interested in acquiring resources to help combat the over-sexualization of young people of color. So if anyone in, is willing to answer that, or, or, or we could also say Google will bless your life, that would be an appropriate answer as well. I think folks are, might be, I, I'm seeing mouths move, but not hearing anything. So if you have an answer, please unmute yourself. I think there needs to be more resources. I don't think we have enough. I think, I think um, this has been a huge vac. I think they're there and I think Google will bless your life. Um, and we need more. The um, Skinner House books, uh, the UUA's imprint, just uh, sent out an email uh, promoting uh, a host of books written um, by uh, Black authors uh, uh, for uh, about Black children, um, but for reading to anybody. They're not limited to readers and young readers who, who are Black or people of color. So. Um, you might look at UCC resources and also at the UUA bookstore. Um, you know, a lot of libraries are still shopping out books during COVID, the pandemic, so you can call your local librarian. Um, you know, you'd have to be very specific in terms of what you're looking for, but in general, you know, body pride um, and, and, you know, what Reverend Cedric was talking about, valuing flesh you know, those kinds of empowerment books um, aren't necessarily going to be under the, the heading books about not sexualizing black bodies, but just about empowering. Um, I think you can find some resources there. Um, there was a sort of off topic question, but I want to get to it quickly. Somebody asked about whether how people are doing OWL during uh, this COVID era. Um, these webinars were started as a way to support folks in thinking creatively about how to serve youth and other OWL participants. If you go to the um, OWL page on the UUA.org uh, website, it's um, UUA.org slash RE slash OWL slash facilitators. There's all sorts of resources there. Amy's resources are a little easier to find. You just go right to uh, the ucc.org, type in OWL in the search bar, and you'll get all sorts of resources. So both places, you can find tips for how you can serve your um, typical OWL participants during this time when it's not safe to gather in person. I want to just also take this opportunity to lift up that um, our next webinar in November will be with uh, Marshall Miller and Dorian Salat, who have authored the revisions for K-1. And they, they, though we had to stop the field test right before the field testing, that it hasn't been field tested, um, they're going to give us some, some uh, information about some of the resources that they updated. So you might want to tune in for that. I talk but a different date. It's not yes, the November first November 11th. It's on November 11th. And that's, that's because of the election. So I wanted to, oh, I see Kim wanted to say, Kim, can I just- I'm sorry, real, real briefly, ahead, one of the things ahead. that I, I'm sorry, one of the things I found helpful, and I don't want to um, 
100% of the time have the response, Google will bless your life, um, even though I believe wholeheartedly it will, is that it helps to reach out to other, other folks, period, not to just to have the questions. So if we go, um, you know, Facebook is very helpful, email, um, we never know who in our faith communities or our, our public sectors, even on a block, our neighborhood, who may also be people that are resources through life experience, through um, institutions. Um, and I would say, ask the question, ask the question publicly and often um, on what you need, specifically what you need. So whether or not it's about the hypersexualization of, of black bodies, or it's about how can we bring in faith or not bring in faith and reach those um, who are considered um, nuns. How can we um, go and, and find the things that we need um, to make sure that we are being anti-racist? So ask the question often to as many people as possible. There are Facebook groups that have been started that you can start as well. Um, start your own Facebook group, ask the question. Um, I think there's also a question about our trainers or facilitators to get support um, when you're in predominantly white settings. And I know that I've been a trainer in a predominantly white setting. And yes, so whether or not it's how can I get a copy of your playlist? What type of playlist can I create? What type of uh, materials can I bring to introduce things? Uh, what things should I stay away from? What things can I bring in that'll speak to the culture um, of the environment? So I would say yes, cast that net and cast it wide. Thank you, Reverend Kim. Um, one of the things I wanted to say is just, I also want to bring us back to thinking again about the values. Um, the, the values are our compass. And if, if that compass is not helping us to move towards a more anti-racist, an anti-racist way of being, we got to get a new compass. <laughs> and so I would say that go back to the values. They should be guiding you. I mean, I also think about things like racism, sexism, homophobia, those are all forms of bullying. When you're thinking about supporting people, how do you support the person who's being bullied or the people who are being bullied? The, these are things that we need to think about. So in go back to the values, think about what that looks like for you and your community and find ways to address, to stay focused on, the, on those values. That's, that's really, it, but it's just an entry point. Um, and I wanna share also a resource, it's called the 21 Day Racial Equity Challenge. And what it's doing, it, so much of this is, about, is also about self-awareness. And it gives you an opportunity to listen, to read, to watch, to explore things around um, issues around racism. So, um, there's a really nice list of of, um, uh, of books, of videos, of, of of talks that you can watch. So I'll put that in the, I don't want to do it now because I know everybody will go to it <laughs> before we're done, but we're almost there. Um, again, go back to the values, look at, take the, um, consider taking the 21 day racial equity challenge. Um, take a look at that as a way to, as a way f to move forward from here. This is just the, just the beginning. Thanks, Anil. Um, I, I want to uh, answer, um, I want to say two things and then uh, make sure we give everybody a, a last word. Um, one is that uh, somebody asked, does the UUA have an OWL Facebook page? There's an OWL Facebook page that is the OWL Facebook page. It's not UUA or UCC. It's a partnership between us. So that that is a joint Facebook page. It's on our whole lives. Um, I wanted to, um, uh, say that we will get the uh, link to the article about uh, racial scripts and also the resource that Anil just mentioned into our follow-up email. So you will all receive that uh, along with a link to the recording um, uh, in the next few days. Any last words? Fantastic, amazing, beautiful, beloved panel. Real quickly, two things. Um, from my tradition and experience and heritage, the ancestors are extraordinarily important. And the ways in which we do ritual during our, our whole life's trainings could incorporate those experiences, which would make it also very meaningful for participants from uh, different backgrounds. So look to the traditions and include them. 
Second thing I want to say is it is a wonderful exercise, Reverend Kim, to Google, because Google will bless your life. But as with every blessing, the blessing is not just for you. So if once you gain knowledge and you've been exposed and you've read all the books and all the articles and you are fully informed, that's not good enough. If you're not taking action and engaging in conversation with people that look like you and come from that experience and you're informing them on what you've learned. So it's not enough to have a selfie of yourself at the protest and think that you have arrived at anti-racism. That is insufficient. I have nothing more to add. Reverend Cedric did just drop the mic, so yeah. That's right, that's right. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you all for participating, both, uh, both to thank the group of the panelists, Anil, for organizing this, and for all of the participants who were here today listening in and uh, who will listen in to the archive version. Um, I have found all of your input so inspiring at times, sort of brought tears to my eyes because you worded things so beautifully. And um, I just, my heart is overflowing with uh, gratitude for your, your participation today. And I will just say amen, amen, and amen. Um, please share this wi widely and wildly. Um, we are blessed beyond belief and so grateful for all of you and your wisdom. Those of you who are appearing on this call and all of you who are participating um, in this learning and in service of all. Uh, we're changing lives, we're changing the world, y'all. Keep doing the work. And thank you for being here.